Okay, everybody, we're going to go ahead and start. I'm Branch Houston. I'm from uh, the University of Illinois in the United States, and I'm Night Chair of Investigative Reporting. Uh, more important, I've been doing data since 1986, which makes me feel really old. Um, but I don't think I'm that old. Um, well, let me go ahead and tell them who you are. I think you've got one up there. Now it is. Yeah. Hi, my name is Helena Bengtsson. I work as the data editor for The Guardian in London. And I had Brandt had been doing this for 10 years when I started. So I started around 1997 and have done data and journalism since then. Hi, everyone. My name is Irene Liu. I'm based in Hong Kong. Um, I was most recently at uh, Thomson Reuters working on their investigative team, the global enterprise team, and I uh, will be starting with Google News Lab in a few weeks. So we're going to go sort of in a succession of presentations. I'm going to do sort of the basics, and I'm going to pull the room a little bit at first so we've got a good idea of where people are in this lineage of what people call computer-assisted reporting, data journalism, data-driven journalism. I think the different names we give to doing this kind of work now is a testament to how many people are now involved. Uh, when I started out, I was in the second wave of people using data and journalism, and there were about 50 of us, so it was easy to know who was doing what. Now there are thousands, it's worldwide, it's wonderful to see. Um, and we still have some basic things that are going on no matter how the technology changes. So how many people in the room will use a spreadsheet for a story? Use Microsoft Excel or something to raise your hand. Okay. How many people might use a database manager? Could be Microsoft Access, something like SQL. How many people on that? Okay. We're still having the same kind of succession of learning. How many people use visualization and data to use for stories? Okay, mapping, charts, and so forth. That's come up really fast and, and, and hard of, of late. Okay, just that gives us a good idea as panelists. Um, we also are hoping to have questions and answers that will go on for a while. We could talk forever because uh, we teach a lot, <laughs> uh, but we don't like to do that. We like to learn things for ourselves. So I'm going to just go through an overview of uh, using data. Notice how I've uh, avoided any uh, label of what this is. It involves data, it involves journalism. And I'm first going to uh, talk about some fundamentals, then a little bit of the history, and then fundamentals again. So I think I'm ready for the next slide. Okay. Why we use data in journalism? One of the first reasons I got into it was to go beyond the anecdotal. I grew up in a time of journalism where if you did four interviews and looked at 20 documents, that was pretty much good enough for a story. And it meant that people could poke holes in an investigative story because you didn't see everything, you just happened to pull, get a few examples. And once I realized that I might be able to use 100,000 records, which is a whole population of something that happened, as opposed to just look at 20 examples, I realized I had much more power in my and trends. No matter how technology has changed, that's really what we're up to, and we keep getting better and better tools to do that. Another one, oops, whoa. <laughs> Another thing is, uh, unlike some professions, we're really interested in the outliers. We're interested in the unusual, not the anecdotal, but how bad a system can be, and that can be shown sometimes by an outlier. And we wanted to be able to present our stories different these days and all this media and all the data flying around. So in the beginning, seven was really a critical moment in the use of data and journalism. There was a journalist in the United States who had started getting training in social science methods. Computers, paper cards, and he had an analysis of the race riots in the U.S. Now it's just changed well, it's on the TV now and broadcast, but who actually participated 
and riots in the city of Detroit found out that people who are more, is most likely to be college educated is not, and they weren't all people from the outside. They said it was outsiders, it can even cause trouble, and actually it's people living there, and who fit social science methods. He then later published a book, Precision Journalism, which remains a basic book that everybody should read at this point. And he, uh, he had an opening line that remains the same, is they're changing the stakes and it takes to be a journalist these days. Um, following Bill Meyer was a guy named Elliot Jaspin, um, and he called what he did, not persistent journalism, but computer-assisted reporting, and he used much more database managers, and what he was interested in doing was joining different tables or files that were not intended to be joined together. For example, to their names as in criminal records. He found matches between criminal records and bus drivers, including child molesters and drunks. And that explained why children were getting run over by buses. Um, he also tried to simplify and use fewer statistics. Uh, a major breakthrough in all of this was he and a programmer put together called, something called a nine track express software, which released us from using these huge mainframes. So we could do things our desktops. Um, and then in the, one of the more remarkable institute that continues to this day, Computer Assisted Reporting Institute in Missouri, which changed training and which allowed people to go um, around the world and train. Okay. It was launched across the U.S. through Investigation Institute for Computer Assisted Reporting. I published a book in 1996 because nobody else would publish a textbook, so I finally wrote it. Um, but I considered it a book that was a spokesperson for about 100 working journalists. Um, in 1996, Nils Mulvad is here. He came over to the U.S. to learn to do data journalism, and he opened up the whole field in Europe and held training uh, sessions there that eventually turned into these conferences. Niels and I uh, thought it would be a good uh, thing in the year 2000 to go global with this kind of training. And in 2001, we had the first conference, a global conference. Uh, you had Google Incorporated that changed everything. And then there was the first conference in Denmark in 2001. Okay. Okay. And the 21st century is when, of course, everyone here knows data exploded, things changed tremendously. Uh, we had taught in London for about 10 years uh, before all of a sudden it caught fire and The Guardian became one of the leaders in doing data journalism in the 21st century. A European data training center, you could get trainers from lots of different places. Investigative journalism centers became the leaders in data training. Uh, open sourcing, open government movie, uh, movement started. And then most important, programmer coders became a routine part of journalism. A bit of a culture clash that is getting ironed out at this point. Uh, let's go ahead. So um, in the 20th century, you have journalists using spreadsheets, database managers, statistical software, visualization of data through charts, mapping, tools, and primitive tools for uh, cleaning data, making data better. And that's really what came along in the 20th century for the most part. And what I didn't include here was the ability to download data and actually put it into some kind of software. Okay. In the 21st century, uh, we started using social network analysis more. You saw an example in Panama Papers this morning. You got programs and tools to analyze unstructured data, text, and that's where we're having big breakthroughs now. Uh, you had more interactive data and visualizations. You had more collection of data through web scraping and more collection of data through crowdsourcing. Incredibly powerful. But what's remained and what's good to remember is we have certain fundamentals in journalism that continue to make us different from advocates and from people who just take data and throw it up on the web and hope people figure it out. We are curators. We are trying to sort and make sense of data. So credibility remains at the core of journalism. Integrity checks of data lead to credibility. We need to not only do integrity checks on whether data is accurate or not, 
but we also have ethical issues on what data to put up. Uh, you know, we're sort of like doctors in that we, want, we don't want to do harm. Do no harm with the data you put up. Um, we have to realize that nearly all databases have, fl have flaws or are incomplete. Uh, that's just, that's a fact of life. And I've had some people say it doesn't really matter, the public will figure it out. They don't figure it out. Digital tools have limitations. Multi-sourcing is key. And the most key thing now, as we've always said about computer assisted reporting and data journalism, is that it's a good start. There are three basic pillars to journalism. That's data slash documents, it's interviewing, and it's field work. You gotta have at least two out of three of those, I think. And three is best. And so just having the data the documents doesn't necessarily mean you have a story. You might have an interesting graphic too, but you don't necessarily have the story. Um, and then one thing, as we've always said in the media, adoption of new media doesn't always mean that you leave the old media behind. History of media has basically been that it gets more and more fragmented as we go along. So there are old tools that are still worth using. Uh, they're still used every day. And just because you adopt a new one does not mean that you leave the old behind. And if there's anything that continues to be the cliche about uh, data journalism, is it's use the right tool for the right job. We used to say, why would you use this piece of software? That's a hammer for something that takes a screwdriver, or a screwdriver for a hammer. So I think these, I'm just trying to lay out what I think are the basics that continue. I continue to work with data all the time, and these are the things I don't think have really changed, and the things that have. So at this point, I'll turn it over to one of the great practitioners, and then another great practitioner. Thank you. I think I can do it myself, I think. Yeah. Because. So I thought I'd step you through a couple of stories I've done. And by doing that, I'll also talk about the tools that I used for those stories. So I'll be turning my back on you guys. I'm sorry about that. So the first story is a very simple story I did a couple of years ago when I still was working at the National Broadcaster in Sweden. And I had a reporter who wanted to look at the situation for people who came to Sweden with a medical degree, but they're from outside of the EU. So you have your medical degree, you are a doctor, but you move to Sweden for some reason. You might flee to Sweden or you might come to Sweden. And if you come from outside of the EU, you have to get your license. You, ha you don't have to go to school, but you have to get your license rectified. So we got a spreadsheet from the health service of all people that have, had applied for this license. And the spreadsheet was basically the list of correspondence. So you can see here the different colors. I did the coloring, the, the agency health didn't do the coloring, uh, is different doctors. So for some doctors, there was just an application and then a response that said, you've got your license. And in some cases, they had several letters back and forth and they needed extra uh, information and that sort of thing. So it's really hard to see how long time did it take for these doctors. So what I did was that I uh, manipulated them a little bit in Excel so that I got the dates from when they applied, and the dates from when they actually got approved on the same row. We do a simple calculation to calculate, and we can see that the, the person who's waited the longest had waited 8,900 days or 24 years from the time he applied to be a doctor to get a medical license in Sweden to the time that he actually got one. And my question is sort of, if you have a 25-year-old medical license, shouldn't you update that before you sort of start working on people? Uh, but this became a story uh, at the news. We found 181 doctors and saw that it took about four years for them, in, on average, to get their 
get their license, which is, in Sweden, we have a high <coughs> demand for doctors. We, we're a big country, we're a large country, and there's a lot of places who don't have doctors. Uh, so it was very strange that we had all these doctors just sitting around waiting until get, they, they were getting their license. If you look at spreadsheets, which is another tool, this is a spreadsheet from the English election in, 2000, in 2015. And if you, now you have to think about the fact that all the polling was wrong. So don't think about that. If we sort of disregard the fact that all the polling was wrong, this is the story we had to, uh, to do a poll projection, to do a projection of the election. So we start out with the results for 2010. We have uh, the national result, and we sorry, there we go. And we look at the polling that is made from different places. And now it starts getting interesting because we had to enter this polling every day, and that had to be by people who weren't that data savvy. So we had to put up a spreadsheet for them. And at the same time, this spreadsheet should also be used for our developers to actually do the visualization on the website. And that w the visualization also changed each day as the polling came in and changed. So we had to do this in a place that worked for both the non-data savvy people and developers and, and technicians. So actually, Google Spreadsheets turned out to be, I'm not, it was probably not the safest place to have it, but it worked for us and worked very well. So we did, this is an Excel formula or a spreadsheet formula I'm extremely proud of. It goes over three rows and it's totally incomprehensible. Nobody, even, not even I now that I look at it, understand how it works. But what it does is that it calculates the probability of who's winning each constituency. And it pulls it down to this that then calculates the winners. And this was then used for this very beautiful projection that our visualization artists did. One thing that you should think, think about that we sometimes forget now that we talk so much about downloading data and uh, using scraping or getting data from authorities is that sometimes you actually can get really good stories just by entering data. So this example is from the Panama Papers, but it could be used applied on any story. Uh, as you probably all know, Panama Papers is a huge repository of 11 billion unstructured documents. There's very little structure. So I decided to build a little island of structure. And we found this correspondence between the company register of the British Virgin Islands and the company Mazak Fonseca. So there were letters going back and forth where the company register asked for information that they legally had access to get, and Masak Fonseca answering those letters. And one thing was that the easiest way to find these letters was to use the phrase, Dear Mr. George. Because that's how Masak Fonseca always answered his letters. They always started with, Dear Mr. George. Dear Mr. George. So one of those letters look like this. Dear Mr. George, we'd like to see the, you, you want to be the beneficial owner of this company. Uh, we, we don't know that. Or, dear Mr. George, you'd like to see the beneficial owner of this company that is Hosni Mubarak. You would think that they would have reacted a little bit more about that. Uh, so on these letters, I sat down and typed in the date the letter was written, the date the answer was written, who was it written to, which company did it concern, were they able to answer the question or not. And that was about 600 letters in the end that we ended that way. And we turned up to do this story talking about how Mossack Fonseca wasn't very good at uh, giving the information and especially not on time. By the time that they had given that information, the company has usually, had usually moved somewhere else, or they moved their assets somewhere else. And I could see in the data that the, the authorities would ask for a company in 2011, 
in 2009, in 2011, and in 2013, for instance. So they were asking the same questions again. One thing that Rand talked about is, of course, the matching of information. And that is one of the coolest things with data journalism. I must say that to have a number of people that one of the oldest data journalism stories in Sweden is we managed to get a list of all the people that had attended the gentlemen's clubs. You know, clubs where the girls take off their clubs. And we also had, of course, lists of people who were in par parliament and that sort of thing. And we matched those two and actually found none. But it was a cool story. It would have been more cool if we found something. So this is another sort of matching that is less sort of there's a lot of donors to the American presidents that have a connection to oil and gas industry. Uh, so I had a reporter in the US who called me up and said, can we do a story on this? I will see how I want to see how much money the different presidential candidates have gotten from oil and gas money. So you can go to the Federal Election Commission in the US and download all campaign data. So I downloaded the data. It looks like this. It's a little scary, but it's, it's OK. I put it into a database. In this case, I used Microsoft Access uh, because it's, it, it's a tool for me that works very quickly. And this reporter wanted it. And we also wanted to do this story very quickly because the presidential candidates were dropping out. So we wanted sort of to do this before Jed Bush dropped out. Um, so you can see here that you have two tables, basically. We have all the individuals that we knew were oil and gas money. And then we have all the money here. And then we basically say, just give me the money where the names match. And don't give me the money for anybody else. And that gives me different sums. So you can see here that there's a lot of people that have given a lot of money. You can also see that they spell their names. The people, at least the people in the front row can see that they spell their names differently. So you have to do a little cleaning. That's usually the case when you do this. But we did, we last did a story about mostly Ted Cruz, actually. It turned out that he had over a half his assets in his suit pack. It was actually for an oil and gas, much more than we had thought before. Uh, you can also get data from PBS. I think that that gets more and more and more important for us as journal data journalists. More and more agencies are publishing their information in PDFs, and they're calling that electronic publish publication. They say, no, we give the information electronically. Look, here's PDF of the Excel file that we have in our, in our, on our computer. And a PDF is much, much harder to you have to learn and process PDFs because a PDF is much, much harder to process than an Excel spreadsheet. So we have to learn different tools to process PDFs. Uh, this is a story that actually, strangely enough, was born at the weekly planning meeting. At The Guardian, nothing is ever born at the weekly planning meeting. Usually it's born somewhere in a reporter's head somewhere. But this was actually born from editors sitting around a table talking about what was important. And we talked about the, all the luxury building that is going around in London. They're building so much, so many apartments. And a lot of those apartments are just dedicated to people with a lot of money. It has marble floors. It has gold faucets. It has, it's, not, it's built for investment, not even to live in, to be honest. So we talked about how can we do this. And one said, my dentist lives in one of those new developments, the Vauxhall Tower. And he says, nobody's there. He, nobody lives there. It's totally empty. People have only bought these apartments for investment. So at that time, the deputy editor looked at me and said, why don't you take a look at this? And I said, yes, sir. Uh, because that's what you say when the deputy editor look at you that way. So we got some initial information from the land registry on who lived there. But I also had some previous databases on property that I wanted to compare with. And when I started to compare these databases, I saw that 
There were a lot of information that we bought from the land registry, and we paid quite a lot of money for this that they hadn't included. I had data in my databases. That's why it's really important. This also taught me that if you've ever gotten a database or downloaded a database, don't throw it away because it can be used in other stories. And in this case, it was an excellent use for me to test their data and actually realize that the data that we had paid money for was not very good. So I had to write a pretty, this is, this is an angry me email in British English. It starts with, I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's how I learned. You do it the British way. So eventually we got the, the real data, but then they said we can only give it to you in PDF format. So I really got text files and I had to write a small program to extract the data out of these text files. And finally I could get a real list of the owners and we could do sorry sorry we could do the story about Vauxhall Tower or we could or we and we can also tell that of the two hundred properties one hundred and eighty four didn't have anybody registered to vote, which is quite a lot. And a hundred and thirty one were owned by either offshore or at least people who had an address outside of the UK. Uh, finally, do I have time for one more? Yeah. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about using programming to get data. This is also a, a, a story we did for the election. We wanted to see, a reporter came to me with a quite cool idea. He said, now that the politician, now that the MPs are gearing up for the election, why don't we go through and see if they're doing any embellishments on their Wikipedia pages to see if they're sort of brushing up their Wikipedia pages. So we, I started looking at that. And I must admit that I was not aware of this before, but actually everything you do, every change that is done to a Wikipedia page is stored. So you can see all the revisions that is made. Everything, even if you go in and change a comma, it goes in there. That was also one of the problems is that everything is in there, even if they go in and change a comma. So I started looking at the URLs for this and could do a list of all uh, MPs and the URL to their history page. And when I had that list, I could write this little program. And if there's any programmers in the hall, I apologize very much for this very this is, I'm not a coder by any means. I steal. That's what I do. That's a great tip to you. You can always steal code. There's code outside on the, inter on the internet everywhere. You can steal it. And then you can check if it works or not. If it works, then use it. If it doesn't work, then steal somebody else's code. That's what I do. So this downloads all the history pages. I beg your pardon? No, I'm sorry, I can't. Also because it's so bad code. It's really bad code. You don't want to steal that screen, that code. But the, what the code produced was the history for all, for all the MPs. And I could quite easily put that into Excel. And as you can see, I constantly return to Excel. And that's one thing that I can use programming, I can use data mass managers, or other tools, but my final analysis always ends up in a spreadsheet, whether it's Excel or a Google spreadsheet or what it is. But I return to that the whole time. And when we started looking at this, one thing that I started noticing was that there were a lot of changes done to this man's page, David Coburn, who actually isn't an MP, he's a member of parliament in the European Parliament instead. And when I started looking at them, the fun thing is that when you do a revision, you can actually make a comment on why you're doing this revision. So I started looking at the comments, and I saw that this was revisions done by himself, which is a really no-no. You're not allowed to change your own page on Wikipedia. That's something that is frowned upon. But he's there uh, doing changes and arguing with this guy because he 
want to have put in that he's attended a certain school. And this guy says, it's irrelevant which high school you went to, you're actually a member of parliament, we can talk about that. And they're arguing. And funnily enough, I started out by looking at, did MPs embellish their Wikipedia pages? What I found was that, no, they actually don't. But I found, so I write, write to the reporter when I do, so when I've done my analysis, I write to the reporter and I say, oh, and by the way, a funny thing is that David Coburn changed his own pages 69 times and he's now forever blocked from Wikipedia. And of course, what ends up being the story, but this ends up being the story. So you should also be, this is also a lesson in that when you do your analysis and do your story, you have to be open for the fact that what you think is story is not the story. All right, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about tools. And uh, for those of you out there who are coders and programmers, the tools that I'm going to talk about are not necessarily what you would use. These are what people like me use, people who are not coders who just want a tool that you can kind of use out of the box that doesn't take that much time to learn. Um, I'm going to go through a lot. What I would say is don't scramble to find URLs and record every single one of them because we'll make this presentation available and you'll see in tiny print the URLs at the top. Okay, so we're just going to speed right through. Um, all right, so the first thing that I love to talk about is smart searching the web. Um, this is particularly useful in uh, places like Asia where we don't necessarily have a lot of access to freedom of information requests, um, where you can't just go to the government and say, I demand that you give me this information in perfect, you know, comma-separated file form. Um, a lot of times you're not going to get it, or sometimes it requires um, a bit of negotiation. And so smart searching the web allows you to kind of uh, take matters into your own hands, see what's out there and uh, use that as leverage in your discussions, your very amicable discussions with government officials um, about getting information. So just a quick example on that. Um, here's a story that we did at the South China Morning Post um, quite a long time ago, about five years ago. Uh, we wanted to look at this issue of what we call colloquially superbugs. Um, basically, uh, bacterial bacteria that in infections that are resistant to antibiotics. This is a big issue in Asia. Um, I know for those of you who are from India, this is a big news talk as well, um, in India as well. Um, Hong Kong actually does a pretty good job of recording uh, infections in, in uh, hospitals, and so we wanted to get information about it. Um, but they didn't really publicize it. And so the first thing we did was we made a request through the code on access to information. Now, this is not FOIA. We do not, we are not legally entitled to this information. It is kind of a way to ask them, and it makes the, gov the government requires that they have to respond to you. Um, you may not like their answer, but they have to at least write a letter to tell you why they're not going to give you the information. So we made this request, and long and short of it is, they said, yeah, we have this data at hospital authority, but we're not going to give it to you because the data isn't ready. Um, they didn't collect it for five years. They, gave, they shared it with the government, um, but they didn't want to share it with the public. And so thus began two months of many, many conversations every single day um, trying to get this information, you know, and asking the same, having circular discussions. Why? Why won't you give it to us? Um, anyway, so while we were having these discussions with them every single day, uh, we decided to basically take a look at what was on Google um, or any search, use any search engine, just to see what was out there, what, um, what, we could, what we knew was out there in the public domain as a way to try to find out what we could ask for. Uh, because if their argument is the data isn't ready, um, we don't release this information. If it had been released by somebody, then we could say, well, actually, you just don't want to give it to us. So we did um, using 
uh, smart search terms. Um, for your own favorite browser, there may be, the search terms are going to be the same. They may be slightly different, but the general premise is the same. We basically, I looked at um, MRSA, Hospital Acquired Infections, and the site was all Hong Kong government websites, and then a file type PDF. The reason we looked at PDFs is because um, presentations are often published in PDFs, same with reports, things like that. So it helps to narrow, because otherwise you're going to get millions of links. And um, maybe you guys have a lot of time, but you know, it's a nice little shortcut. Um, anyway, so one of the things that we found was a, um, a presentation by a, a doctor who, or um, uh, yeah, doctor who worked for the Department of Public Health about MRSA, and in this, they talked about mortality rates of hospital patients who got MRSA infections. They talked about the number of cases. Um, they gave little graphics of by hospital, but not very in tiny print, so you couldn't see which hospital was doing well and wasn't doing well. But what we were able to do then is say, hey. So you say this data is not ready, but here I found this you know, nifty little presentation on your website. So I think that obviously the data is ready and you should give it to us. Because if you don't, then we're just gonna publish what you have from this presentation. Um, which, you know, of course, we know you wanna provide context. We know you want to, you know, we wanna give you every opportunity to explain the story. So why don't you work with us, right? And this is after two months. Um, but anyway, finally, in the end, um, they were able to, we were able to get the data. I'm not messing things up here. Uh, we were able to get the data and uh, begin to publish stories. So they didn't have to give us the information, okay? But in the end, after a lot of polite harassment, um, they decided to relent because they knew that we were going away. You know, if you call them every single day for, you know, two months, they know that you're going to stick with the story, right? So we were able to really pressure them to, to release the data. And they've been re releasing it quarterly ever since, which is kind of a triumph, right? Because in a place where they aren't required to, you can use your own information and what you can find to persuade them to, to, to act. Um, another quick little thing about smart searching that I think is very helpful, um, I don't know if you guys have ever encountered this, but sometimes it's hard to get interviews with officials. They don't want to talk to you about stories, certain stories. Um, but it's also helpful, another thing you can do with smart searching is you can look to see if they've ever talked about the issue that you're talking about. Um, and essentially use their words against them or use the words to persuade them to talk to you, right? So one of the things that we wanted to do was to look at what officialdom um, was talking about in terms of addressing hospital-acquired infections. And of course, they said that the hospital authority chief was not available for an interview, but he had just spoken about, he had just written a whole newsletter about this issue in it. And so we were able to pull a not particularly sexy quote, but at least a quote from him um, that could kind of demonstrate that at least they're paying lip service to uh, wanting to address the issue. And so, you know, finally we're able to run a bunch of stories, look at the data, and, um, you know, get something out there that hadn't been, which um, really, honestly, I don't think we would have been able to do had we just said, hey, give us the data and just left it at that. So that's one thing that's really valuable. Um, in terms of other types of search, it's not just text. You can search by image. This is particularly helpful if you're doing an investigation and you have a photo from a meeting or a conference that has people together and you wanted to see where else that photo has appeared. Maybe that will link you to other sources of information, other people. Uh, revert, tin eye is a reverse image search. So basically you upload um, a picture or you put a URL for a picture and it will tell you where else it appears on a website. Um, Google has a similar thing as well, uh, Google image search. Um, they also do things in Google image search where you can search by similar colors, things that look alike. Um, I don't know, it's never been helpful for me in the story, but it's fun if you want to look through it. Um, and then, of course, you know, one thing that you'll see when um, we talk to who do a lot of online verification for video, citizen journalism, that sort of thing, uh, Google Earth is very, very helpful if you're trying to um, verify uh, information. Uh, just a quick thing, uh, I'm, I'm using Google as an example just because I feel like um, a lot of countries, um, people use Google quite often, but if I do other um, search engines also have similar search terms. You can do a lot more of narrowing your search than just like, typing in words. So I encourage you to look at that. Um, another resource, uh, you know, internet. A lot, a lot of stuff lives in the internet. But sometimes it gets taken down. So um, one thing you can do is look at the cache in your search to find old versions of websites. Um, also, the Wayback Machine is a very useful tool um, to look 
for old versions of uh, spreadsheets, or sorry, not spreadsheets, um, spreadsheets in the brain, um, other websites, but also on top of this, this is a very useful tool when you are doing long investigations because if you want to archive a page, archive it here. I always say take a screenshot, print a copy in PDF, and, and make sure you label it very well because otherwise you won't remember where it is. And also use Wayback Machine. Um, in an investigation that we've done bef that we did before, um, as the investigation went on, um, as they found out what we were looking at, suddenly web pages were disappearing. This is a very good way to keep a record, and it's kind of a third party, so you can um, kind of use that as a as a way to keep a record, a public record of it. Um, social media increasingly important. Brant mentioned this. Um, tools to help you to comb through the vast whatever you call it, just the, 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 the masses of data and random ephemera that exist in social media. Um, one quick, easy tool that was developed by Storyful, which specializes in online verification, uh, especially of social media, is uh, Storyful Multi-Search. Basically, this is a plugin that's available on Chrome. You download it, and then if you hit the little, if you see the tiny little orange search button here, um, you type in a search term, and it will search all the social media. Twitter, Instagram, and all that. So it's a kind of easy hack, and it'll pop it up into new tabs. Um, if you use Twitter a lot as a, as a resource, um, you can actually, and you don't want to spend all your time building your own Twitter lists, you can actually um, take other people's Twitter lists, if they make them public, um, by copying them and just importing them. So um, one quick trick is if you know somebody who's an, a very active Twitter user for a particular subject and you want to have a log of who they follow, um, if they have made that list public, you can just copy it into your own and make your own list. So that's a really, really helpful tool. Um, PicoDash is a way of searching Instagram. So that's a, that's a cool little tool. Um, Feedly is a tool that allows you to essentially organize um, YouTube channels and things and put them into different categories so that you can easily access them. Um, Amnesty International has created it's called YouTube Data Viewer, which allows you to look the metadata on YouTube videos. Um, people is a online resource to search for people. So, um, you know, this depends on, you know, what country you're in and what's available online and how much of a digital presence, presence someone has that you're looking for, but it's a good resource to look at. Same with Spokio. Uh, Reportive is a kind of a fun little tool. I don't know if any of you, if, if you use Gmail, uh, I really encourage you to uh, download this plugin because basically what it does is if you're looking at your email, anyone, what it does is it basically links to LinkedIn. And so if somebody's email has um, been used to build a LinkedIn profile or is connected to a LinkedIn profile, it'll show in a window um, right, right in your Gmail screen so you can see who, you know, who it is. Or if you're looking for a job, you can add them. So this is just to show you what it looks like. This is my husband, um, and he's talking about baseball, which is not that exciting. But um, he, but you can see that because of it's his personal email address, um, it pops up his LinkedIn profile. Um, you can use this kind of go the opposite direction. If you need to give someone's email address and you don't know who it is, you can now start typing, guessing about email addresses and typing them in into Gmail, and then if it comes up with a LinkedIn profile link, then you know that that's a good email address. So it's okay to kind of reverse engineer it. And here's this random guy who did a video about it, so you can look up and learn how to do it. Um, another thing you can do on Facebook is, Facebook's just kind of weird, but if you're looking for people, one of the good ways to do it is, especially if someone has a common name, if you know their email address, you can actually plug in the email address and see if it's connected to a Facebook profile. Um, this is not a slam dunk necessarily because if somebody has privacy settings where they don't allow you to do this, of course that won't work. But this is a good way if you want to number one, verify an email address and or also find an alternative way to contact someone besides email. If they're not turning your email, maybe they'll bring a Facebook message. You know. um, so just an example of what it looks like. Um, if you just want a kind of a cool little video to see how um, people use these kinds of tools, um, on there's a TED Talk by um, someone who was one of the founders of Storyful, and he talks about online verification. Um, and it's a, it's a kind of nifty tool, and they show you how to how they do it. Um, and then also, if you want to keep up, social media changes, the tools change like every day. So um, this presentation will, will be obsolete next year. 
But if you want to keep track of the tools that are available, there's something called the First Draft News, which is actually a collaboration between different news organizations, and they really are keeping um, track of the different tools that are available for journalists to use to, use to track social media. Metadata. Metadata is another fun one. Um, one of the ways that we use metadata is um, to, to do various kinds of stories. A lot, and one thing I would like, caution about metadata is that um, it can be changed. So I never really use, I never use metadata really as a primary source. It's really a kind of a source to help you and give you clues to further avenues of inquiry. And I'll explain how we do that. So um, I don't know if any of you guys recognize who's in the picture here, but you have former President Jiang Zemin and his beloved grandson, Alvin Jiang. And so one of the things that we wanted to do at Reuters was we wanted to write a story about this private equity fund that um, the grandson at the tender age of 29 had started, um, which became one of the biggest uh, private equity firms in terms of um, China deals um, very quickly. And so uh, we worked on um, sort of how that private equity firm was started and who, um, and one of the first deals that really launched the firm. And one of the things that we found was um, in the press that had, when the firm started was, you know, the people who were in charge of the, or nominally in charge of the, uh, of the, of the private equity firm really downplayed the role of Alvin Zhang, the, the grandson. They're like, oh, he's a junior partner. He's, you know, he's just starting with us, working with us. Um, but that wasn't what we were hearing anecdotally from other people, you know. Over coffees in bars, they were saying, "Oh yeah, he's really the center of this, right?" So, how do you reconcile those two narratives, right? So, one of the things that we did was we just started looking to see what kind of um, you know documentable footprint there was. Um, it's a picture of Uber. So, one of the things that we did was because this firm was registered in Hong Kong, looked at the Hong Kong company registry to see who had been, who, who started the firm, who filed the paperwork, and what you see is that contrary to the narrative. Um, Alvin Jung was actually the person who signed the document that essentially launched the firm, right? So there you have one solid piece of evidence that, shed, that countered the narrative of, oh, he's a junior partner, because would you really have a junior partner be the person to sign the paperwork to start the company? Another thing that we wanted to do was look at um, a website. Now, they did not have a public website, but we guessed like any firm opening in the 21st century, you want to control your domain name, right? So one of the things we did was just went in and guessed about potential um, URLs that would be used. And what we found was that, in fact, the registered name for boyucapital.com was Alvin Jung. Now, who is, um, who is, how many of you guys have ever used the Whois database? Okay, it's a great tool. Um, who is database basically, when you register a uh, for a website, you're supposed to put in a bunch of information about who who owns the database. Now, for a lot of companies, if you pay some amount of money, you can actually have that information shielded, right? So that it doesn't become public. Um, but in this case, actually, it was it was public. Um, and he, what you could see was that there was an address and phone number registered. As it turned out, this was not actually his own address. He doesn't live in this neighborhood, which is much more of like a middle class neighborhood. But um, it would be a way to kind of try to find. It's, it's obviously somebody who's related to him, right? Presumably, um, in terms of having a connection. So you could actually, you know, doorstop, make a phone call. Again, this is a, a clue to help you in your investigation. Um, because you can shield your information, um, sometimes this doesn't actually give you any information. But sometimes when people initially register, they don't shield their um, the, their information. But then later they realize, oh no, my stuff is my, my information is online. Let me pay the extra ten dollars and have it shielded. But um, there are tools out there, such as domain tools, where you can actually look at the history of the registration. So even though right now that information is not available, if you use the tool, you can actually look at the old archive. Um, who, the domain tools is actually a paid service, but um, you can get a trial for a while for free. Um, another thing that's very useful is photo metadata, right? Again, as we talked about earlier, maybe you have a copy of a digital photo from a conference, a meeting, whatever it is. Um, remember, metadata can be changed, but it can be useful sometimes. So here is an example of a picture of my dog that uh, we took in our apartment and, um, and put it into something called Jeffrey's Exit Viewer, which is just a free tool online. And amazingly, it gave you a crazy amount of information about the photo, right? It was an Apple iPhone 5. 
It was taken um, at an altitude of, of like basically 232 feet, which was not exactly correct, but it showed that it was pretty high up in a building. Um, that's not exactly my home address, so don't come to visit because that's not my address, but pretty close actually. Um, so anyway, it has a lot of information available on the photo menu. It also can get you in trouble if you're a reporter. Um, so I was following around this guy who was on the run from the police, and they took a picture with, with him, uh, John McAfee, and they're like, ha ha, we know who, where he is, but you guys don't. And they uploaded this photo, and then someone looked at the metadata, and they're like, oh, that's where he is, and then he got caught. So if you're a reporter and you plan on bragging about the fact that you know where someone is that no one else does, don't send a photo. Clear the metadata before you upload the photo. Um, another example is just um, you, there's metadata on uh, emails as well, depending on how people have their settings set up. So this is, again, not foolproof, but um, can be a useful avenue. Um, what you can do is, in the email, you can actually look through, um, go to show original, which provides a lot of the metadata in the background, put the IP address into, uh, into there are many of these tools, but what's my IP address dot com is one of them. And so in this case, um, I had sent the email from my uh, Thomson Reuters email at the time to my Gmail, um, and I was able to basically show that um, the server that it was sent from was a Thomson Reuters uh, server. Uh, another cool thing that you can do with metadata for PDFs is, um, again, I, I have to, I, I keep repeating this, but I really want to emphasize, you really need to use this as just a clue. I, I, metadata can be changed. But uh, for one of the investigations that we did at Reuters about um, cheating on the SAT, we were talking about the proliferation of copies of the SAT test that were showing up online. So, um, you know, bootleg tests. And so one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to look at the provenance. Um, how many of these were coming from the same source? Um, and there are different ways you do that, right? Um, if it's a PDF, if it's scanned from a machine, you can see are there you know, little marks that... Um, imperfection that match up from different sources. You can see if it's, you know, it looks like it's from the same document. Um, another thing you can do, and so this is what you were seeing. We were seeing from multiple websites. People just had links to all these files and PDFs of different tests, right? And so we wanted to just see um, where they were coming from, if they're all the same source. So in this case, one of the copies that we had, we looked in the description, and you could see that the file was created on, on May 23rd, 2014, at least according to the metadata which was actually before the, when the test was actually going to be used. So we wanted to, so, so the, that lent a little bit credence to our hypothesis, which was that actually the test had been used before the test actually came out, right? In addition to that, because we had other metadata, like, you know, the application that was used, whatever, when we were downloading the same test from different sites, we also, we saw the metadata was coming, was also very similar, right? So the, it looked like the same source document was spread around. Um, again, this is not something that we would pu necessarily publish this information, but it was a clue that reinforced our hypothesis, which was great. Um, and visualization. So where to start? Excel actually can do quite a bit on, um, in terms of visualization, so charts and things like that. Um, it's very quick, it's not the most beautiful, but it gets you, gets the job done, especially if you're using visualization as a tool for uh, analysis and um, and then you know you give this to your amazing designers and graphics people and they will make it look good right um, other tools that are available that are more out of the box that um, do look nicer a bit um, so tableau public tableau um, the paid version you can um, they actually are quite generous to journalists so you can actually um, request for uh, an account there uh, Google charts is another one that is free uh, mapping very important. So for story generation, this can be very, very helpful, right? So um, as Brent talked about, going from the anecdotal to um, concrete information. You make a request, you hear something, you make a request for data, you finally get it, um, and it has a geospatial element to it. Um, there are a lot of different tools that can help you analyze the data. And so in this case, um, one of the stories that we wanted to talk about was a reporter at the SEMP had heard from some advocates that there was a really, you know, that Nathan Road, which is one of the busiest roads in Hong Kong, was really dangerous and people were getting hurt through traffic accidents or killed all the time. And the, gov and the government knew about it for years and years and years, but wasn't doing anything about it, right? That's okay as a story. You know, according to one advocate, the government isn't doing anything about deadly traffic accidents. Okay, that's not an awesome story. 
What would be a better story is, according to Department of Transport statistics, X number of people have died in the past year, and you know more people have died in previous years, right? Whatever. So after, again, a very, very lengthy negotiation discussion about getting the data, um, we were able to do it. And then what he was able to do is, um, this is an example of what you can find, what they were providing initially, um, and then they eventually gave us the actual raw data. But uh, Chris Ip, who had never used Google Fusion Tables before, spent two hours this afternoon, plugged the data in, and was able to really truck in, create a visual of um, where, where the accidents were happening and how, how many had happened in different places. Um, the little black dots were places where the government said was um, a dangerous site. And um, we were able to look at it through the years. And what he did was after he created this map, he basically handed it over to um, the design team, um, and they were able to create this awesome looking visualization that they were able to put on the front page. Um, and he didn't, he's not a programmer, he just did it in an afternoon. Um, again, these are the other kinds of visuals that you can do with Google Fusion tables. Uh, other tools out there for mapping, CartoDB is one. Uh, GIS. Now, some of these you have to, you, you can get a free trial, and then again, they are quite generous with licenses. So um, for journalists, so you can actually go through and request. Oh, okay, great. So um, GIGN can help you to get um, access to these tools as well. Social network analysis. Again, this is something that came originally from uh, like academia, uh, but is becoming increasingly popular and used in journalism. Um, one of the stories that we did at the South China Morning Post, again, uh, was looking through lots of documents to try to identify um, links. And so one of the things, again, we went through the company's registry and looked through these documents. And it's just, it was hundreds and hundreds of pieces of paper, right, that were PDF. Um, we, you know, and we weren't even sure. I mean, the initial impulse is, let's create a spreadsheet, right? But the problem in this case was the information was so sprawling, we didn't even know how to structure the data in a way that we knew we could analyze. So actually what um, I started doing in this story was actually just hand drawing to try to you know, circle and lines, then it became too complicated. And so then we basically started doing was actually using a tool to kind of just put addresses and names and you know, connecting them together. And what we were able to do is find a visual pattern from that. Um, and then from there, after the story was done, the investigation was done, we handed it over to the design team and they actually made it much prettier, right? Perfect, yep. Um, so you know, in this case, just an example, uh, I use something called OmniGraffle, which allows you to just create circles and lines and then you can move them around and stuff like that. There are lots of tools like this. Visio is another one through Microsoft. There are a bunch of others as well. Um, and then if you, but if you do have um, a structure, if you know what you're looking at in terms of you know, companies versus people and how they connect, and it has, you have a very straightforward structure for it, there's something called Kumu, which allows you to upload um, a spreadsheet to their thing, and into, their, into their software, and then they can, um, they'll actually do the visualization. You can customize it a bit as, as well. Um, on visualization, um, I actually have cribbed a, um, a resource from another participant in the audience, uh, Jane Pong, who uh, has who uh, was my colleague at the South China Morning Post as well as Reuters, um, and she is a guru in terms of uh, using data for uh, visual storytelling. And she is a meticulous pinner on pinboard. So if you want to learn about um, any aspect of data visualization and you want tutorials and links to how to learn these different tools, um, she has cataloged them in an amazing resource and tagged it incessantly. So if you want to learn, if you want a video tutorial about um, you know, D3, whatever, whatever, you can actually find that here. Um, and so I can't uh, vouch for, you know, if there's a offensive video that Jane has put on there, um, you can talk to her. She's right in the middle of the audience right now. Um, but it's a great resource I use all the time. So um, another place to go. Um, as I mentioned, I am going to be starting with Google News Lab pretty soon, um, and we'll be doing a lot more training in Asia. Um, and actually, my soon-to-be colleague, um, who is the media training specialist in India, um, is also at the conference as well. So um, if you want, keep in touch. Um, it, by mid-October, I'll probably be able to tell you if you're interested in training and resources and things like that or potential collaborations, uh, just keep in touch with me. That's my email address. And as I mentioned, 
uh, we'll uh, make this PowerPoint available so that you can actually um, try out all the different tools. And I hope you guys, thanks very much. Questions? Yes. And if you just identify yourself and then decide who you want to ask. Okay. Uh, Nadia. I just want to comment on the way by way by way back machine drive to it's it's what offline most of the time it's offline that may be depending on where you're living uh, it depends on the country yeah I think uh, it gets blocked occasionally so maybe I have to use Tor project or another project yeah I would I think that's what's going on. One thing I need to let you know about the Wayback Machine is corporations or governments can ask for pages that have been archived to be removed. After 9-11 in the United States, our government agencies uh, eliminate quite a few. Uh, so I go with Irene, and I know Helena says too, is when you see a page, take a screenshot of it. You never know if it'll ever be there again. That's mm -hmm. true about the web. But know that about archive.org. That's even... Uh, uh, more of a peril than whether it's accessible. But it, it, it's, for me, I have not had one day in the last 10 years that was online. Mm -hmm. Or you can uh, use uh, uh, Windows HTTP track to download on the website, even from the archive. Yeah, yeah. Yes. right, okay. right. Grab it the moment you see it. <laughs> it's like all reporting. <laughs> yes, another question back there. Uh, I'm Yi Shan Chen from Taiwan. I'm uh, just curious, uh, what's the suggestion if a uh, uh, news organization want to start their uh, data team? So what's uh, your suggestion? What's the first step? And uh, yeah. Excel. 89% of data journalism or computer system reporting, whatever you call it, is being done in, in Excel still. There is a term that we've had in the U.S. a long time called uh, keep simple, stupid, kiss. And Excel, it makes sure it helps you stay out of trouble. And you want to keep it simple, also. I would also say that you should identify the one or two people that already have this interest and work on them. I think that trying to lift the whole newsroom, you will always have people who don't want to do this. Concentrate on the few people who actually do and give them time and give them the ability to teach themselves. That's really important. And teach them how to teach. That's the most important thing. Yeah. yeah. One thing I would also suggest is, you know, a lot of times at conferences we like to use the big, amazing, impressive examples. Um, you can use Excel to, as a as a journalism hack to make your life easier on a small daily stories, right? And so that is where I think is most valuable to get people to start because number one is achievable and they see it in print. Um, and it actually is, you're going to get more bang for your buck anyway. The other thing I like to talk about, I, the way that I learn about this and the way that um, I, I tell my students when I'm teaching is the best way to learn how to do this is number one, by doing, which goes to the example of using small, you know, doing this on a small story or a shorter, faster story. But then also look at the people who are doing this very well, read the story carefully, and try to, in your mind, go through the exercise of reverse engineering. How did they do it? Where did they get their data from? How, what did they do? What questions were they asking of the data? And work backwards. That exercise will teach you more about it than, um, than anything else. And then, of course, coming to conferences like this, because then you hear from the people who are doing the work and, um, and you know, hearing exactly how they went through it step by step, right? So if you've identified that one person who is really bombing in your newsroom, maybe devote a bit of your budget to send them to a conference like this and encourage them to talk through and, and think through uh, the stories that inspire them. We'll go to another one, and I just oh. wanted to add the, uh, one of the best stories I ever did was 40 rows and 10 columns of unsolved murders, and it led to uh, eventually the discovery of a serial killer. That was a very small data set, and the clue was by sorting. So, <laughs> yes. Oh, hi. Uh, I'm Ramesh Basal. I work with Earth Journalism Network. It's a global network of environment journalists. Uh, we have a website in Turtle, uh, which is called turtle.net. 
We also do a bit of uh, data journalism uh, things, um, but we do more on geospatial data. Uh, so these are more complex um, uh, from the process of generation, uh, and it's a bit hard to understand all these technical processes to, you know, uh, to visualize those things. Uh, it may give different scenario if you change it in some ways. So what we try to do is we've we established a platform called data.thirdpole.net where we upload uh, in some format, for example, save files or KML, and that will automatically change into PDF, CSV, and other formats kind of thing. That will be more helpful for journalists like us to understand more or give trainings. So have any one of you have done this uh, Jewish special um, data search analysis and then visualize it and to have some um, examples on how we can move further? There's, there, I mean, there's amazing work that's being done, um, you know, especially with like the satellite ching and you know things that you can buy. I mean, I would encourage you to look at ProPublica. Um, they did this beautiful project about Louisiana, which is a state in uh, the United States that's essentially going underwater, right? And so they use amazing, you know, satellite imagery. They had to pay for it, um, part of it, but really, really fantastic work. Um, in, when it comes to mapping, what I would say is see if easiest to learn tool can do what you need to do and then work your way up, right? So um, I would say, you know, the out-of-the-box tools like CardoDB um, and Tableau and Google Fusion Tables, see if that can get you where you need to go. Um, if it doesn't, then work your way up. ArcGIS is the one that, you know, has been around for decades. It's kind of the Cadillac, right? Um, and you can do, you know, very simple mapping, but you can also do very, very, very sophisticated uh, geospatial analysis on it as well. This is what geographers, cartographers, um, scientists, academics use, right? But again, I would encourage you, <laughs> start with start with the, the bicycle, the tricycle, and then move your way up. Uh, yeah, I just want to emphasize also that if you're doing advanced analysis, check with the experts. There will be experts, geographical experts or expert with the field because with you spatial data if you have the wrong trajectory it's very easy to calculate the wrong distance to things. Yeah. Well I think we have time for a couple more questions to start a little bit. Anybody anybody else? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask Helen about the structuring the uh, structuring the data. From the unstructured, uh, you uh, do analysis for all the emails related to one person, Hasni uh, Mubarak, and how much time it take from you to do this Excel? It probably took a couple of weeks for me to to search because there was also we also had I also chose different kinds of search methods to make sure I got as many letters as possible. And then enter the maybe maybe a week, two weeks maybe to sort of print them to sort of type them in. I took it I showed it more as an example of a way to do data when you might not have access to a lot of data services. To to actually start a spreadsheet uh, over, for instance, one of the oldest tricks that also that Ralph also talked about is that if you're at a news organization that you start uh, logging something like, for instance, the murders. If you log every murder that happens, that may, might be just a little note somewhere in your paper. You start logging them, start adding in information like geography, where they happen, about the victims, maybe about if they know who did it, that sort of thing. By the end of the year, you will have a database that can give you a couple of stories, it can give you the most dangerous street in your town or it, it can give you other things. So by logging different things, just typing things into a spreadsheet, you get structural things, but you also can actually get a story out of that. A very small, very quick example. Another thing I got, we got reports from prisons about runaways from prisons. There were only 30 reports. So my colleague says, why should you put that in Excel? We can just read them, and there's only 30 papers. And I said, well, let me, I'll, I'll do it. You go ahead and read. And when we when you start structuring text, like a report, for instance, you start talking about 
how did they run how did they break out of prison what tool did they use how many were they did they have help that sort of thing all of a sudden we saw a pattern where we saw that they were using wire cutters you know time that cut wires in several cases in eight out of these 30 cases and when we looked close to that we saw that they even sometimes went to the foreman and said could we please borrow a wire cutter and they actually <laughs> got the wire cutter and they cut themselves out of prison and that was just the documents and it became a quite good story so by doing your own databases not necessarily downloading data you also get stories that nobody else has there there sorry are there any other questions One other point that I like to make about this is that you know right now we're talking about you know you'll see these lists of tools for journalists, but a lot of times things that you use all the time you can apply as a hack for uh, for this. So for example, if you get three PDFs and you're looking for a specific name, put them in a folder and then use your spotlight or search and just look up the name, right? And that may will that can help you narrow, you know, which documents, which letters have a certain name in it. Um, you don't need to build a scraper for for that. You know, if you again find the easiest tool, see if it works. If it doesn't do what you needed to do, then scale up. You'll save a lot of time and um, a lot of heartache as well. Yes, we, we, do we have a question? Yeah, we can't see you. Can you? Stand this up? is more just of an interest question. But has there been much journalism work done with big data, and like, because that's a different type of ballpark completely. I've just been reading a lot about how, like, yeah, big, a big thing, yeah. Uh, there have been some, well, there's some major projects. The Panama Papers, big data. Uh, there have been a lot done with medical records in the United States, uh, very large data. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it depends. You can do a lot with very small data. You can do a lot with big data. Go ahead. I know that the Japanese television did an amazing big data. That's the best, and they almost only example of big data journalism I've seen where they got hold of all data traffic around the time of the tsunami and they could show both sort of data traffic but also mobile phones and uh, positioning of mobile phones so that they could show how people moved and how people fled and then came back when the tsunami happened. That is actually the best that's an amazing example of data and data journalism. Anyone else? A couple of things before we close. There are lots of resources out there. Do go to the GIJ Insight uh, site because we're putting up uh, the most popular digital tools of the week or what's heavy on that traffic. There are resources there. Also, IRE.org has an amazing, amazing uh, list of tip sheets and has probably the, still the premier listserv where people discuss these problems and data called NICAR-L. You don't have to be a member to get on it. Um, lots of interesting discussions from simple to complex. So there are a lot of places to go after this. Hopefully we've intrigued you enough that you'll start looking for simple solutions out there. And uh, because for journalists, time is everything. And the more we can save time and do things simply, the better. So thanks very much for coming. Thanks to the panelists.